Hello, Crossing Church. We are so glad that you have joined us for service today. My name is Scott, and I am the executive pastor with The Crossing. Our desire is to help you take your next step with Jesus, whatever that is. And to do that, we have three very simple links that you can use to connect with us. The first one is Crossing Connect. It's a digital connection card where you can let us know that you've attended service today, or you can use it to let us know how we can be praying for you, or you can also use that to respond to any of the opportunities to connect that you find out about today. Crossing Give allows you to partner uh, in ministry with The Crossing as we reach our community and the world with the good news of Jesus. And finally, there's Crossing Central, and that is the place where you will find about, out about everything going on at The Crossing, from events to life groups to opportunities to serve. We really hope that you enjoy service with us today, and we look forward to connecting with you real soon. Say rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. are your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see Captives' hearts release the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your king. The darkness fear, joy your mighty hand in our streets and land. Say your church on fire when this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom's power reach in near and far no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts you made us for much more than this away the kingdom seed and eyes fill us with the strength and love of Christ
When this nation back Change the atmosphere Built your kingdom Well, good morning, church. My name is Kendall, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor at The Crossing. And if you're a guest with us today, I am so glad that you're here. It is my prayer that you will encounter the life and the healing and the forgiveness and the light that Jesus wants you to bring, wants to bring to you. So be open and ready for whatever he has. There's a couple things I wanted to make you aware of. First of all, tonight, yes, tonight's the night from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Grove. It's our outdoor game night and shaved ice. So bring a friend, bring a chair, come and hang out as long as you like. We're gonna have a potato cannon and maybe some horseshoes and outdoor games. And we're just gonna have a grand old time. So come tonight. Bring somebody you know who doesn't have a meaningful connection with God or any church and we'll have a grand old time at the Grove. Secondly, I know I've said this like four weeks in a row now, but we have our building permit. Woohoo! Now we're doing the contractor dance, I'm calling it. Uh, next step is to sign the contracts and get the loan closed. And so right now we're negotiating with contractors who are worried about price fluctuations. And so I think we got one left, maybe two, and then we're almost there. In the meantime, we need to get ready to live in our new building. We've got to furnish it. And so we're in a capital campaign. It's called A Place to Call Home. And our goal between now and the end of the year is to raise $105,000 to fill our building. We need auditorium chairs. We need kids' equipment. We need security system and audiovisual and all, all that kind of stuff. It's going to cost about $105,000 thousand dollars and just in case you haven't heard this part what makes it a little bit more urgent for us right now is that before we close on our loan the lender would like to know that we have the hundred and five thousand dollars not in hand but committed so that, that they know that we're going to actually be able to live in the building once we get it built so far we're at seventy four thousand one hundred and seventy five dollars that's committed between now and the end of the year that's awesome it means we're over two-thirds of the way air but we're still just under one-third to go so if you haven't already done so please go to that crossing home link and make your housewarming commitment and it's important for you to do that because then we have a record that we can show to the lenders saying hey this is these are the people who committed um, and so you can uh, when you click submit on that form it will take you to our secure giving site where you can start giving toward the furnishings i know that god is going to bring in everything we need because he always does and he always will and so i invite you to join me and where God is taking us next. If you'd like to join in our broader mission, uh, you can, to help people know and follow Jesus, go to that Crossing Give link and it'll take you to our secure site and walk you through the process. Most of you know that it's our habit that whenever we pray for our offering, we always pray for another church in the area. Because how many churches are there in Central Florida? One. It's the Church of Jesus and we want to see it flourish. However, in keeping with our theme from last week, the country, country of the week instead of the church of the week, um, I'd like to choose uh, our daughter church, Cornerstone, in Haiti. Uh, in case you haven't heard the news, the, prime, or the president of Haiti was assassinated a few days ago, and um, my goodness, Haiti is in such chaos. It already was in such chaos, and it's in even more chaos now, and the need is greater than it ever has been. And here's the thing, folks. We are there on the ground. We have hands and feet on the ground with the people. And so I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, we're, we're collecting some funds to send to our church and our 300 students at Cornerstone Academy and Cornerstone Church to make sure that they stay fed. You can see the picture on screen here is, is the last time we fed them. We want to make sure that they continue to be fed during all of this turmoil. And you can, it's pretty easy to just go to that Crossing Give link and in the drop down menu, uh, just choose Haiti uh, and, and we'll make sure that it gets there. All right. So two opportunities to give. I invite you to, to give generously to both of them as we participate in God's work together. So let's pray for Cornerstone and our friends in Haiti right now. Pray for our offering, and then we'll dive into the book of Mark. Father, good morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you that you are in this day and, and with us and for us. And I, I pray that more than anything else right now, that you will remind us that you are here. And Lord, let us be present to you. 
I pray that you open our eyes and our ears to whatever it is you have next for us and give us the courage to take that step into that next. Lord, we are reminded and sobered this morning by the assassination of the president of Haiti. And Lord, that country and those people have gone through so much pain and suffering and exploitation and, and live in such deep poverty. And, and Lord, we thank you that we know people there, that we have friends there, and that we can make a difference. And so, Lord, we pray for that nation. We pray that you will bring peace out of chaos, that you bring order out of the mess. And Lord, I pray for the pastors of the churches there, that you will use them to bring your kindness and your love and your presence to those people who so desperately need it. And Lord, we want to pray especially for our sister church, Cornerstone and Cornerstone Academy. We pray for those 300 kids. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to feed them and educate them, and they'll be up to the chance to, to feed that whole community. And so, Lord, I pray that you will nudge us to be generous to them today, not just to be generous to our place to call home today. Lord, you are taking us into your future, and we want to go with you. And so would you lead us, help us to answer your call. We pray your blessing on Cornerstone Church. We ask that you will let them flourish in the midst of all the unpleasantness and that your hand and your presence will be on them. Lord, as we give you our gifts this week, we give not because we have to, but because we really do want to be part of what you're doing. And so we pray that you will use it, and we thank you that you already are. In Jesus' name, amen. Doug Lansky is a travel writer and a photographer and has gone all over the world and he has collected photos of odd signs that he has found and put them in this book. It's called Sign Spotting, The Art of Miscommunication. So I thought I'd show you just a few of the signs that Doug Lansky has dug up. In Grenada, Spain is this one, Physically Impossible Entry. <laughs> Okay, then why is it an entry at all if it's physically impossible to enter? Strange sign. Here's the second one in Austin, Texas. <laughs> Please be aware that the balcony is not on the ground level. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> you have to wonder, there's gotta be a story behind that sign and it probably did not end well for whoever it was that didn't realize that. The next sign is, is in the Hayek, ooh, Haleakala, there we go, Haleakala National Park in Hawaii. It says bottomless pit, 65 feet. <laughs> that was just funny, just, just looking at it. This one is in, in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. It says on a store, sorry, we're open. <laughs> This next one is from Cairn, Australia. It says, caution, slow kids rode with no shoulders. Those poor kids with no shoulders running around in that road. This one's from Clearview, New Hampshire. It's the name of their city. Clearview is obscured by all the foliage. And then the last one comes to us from Cave Creek, Arizona. It says, no skateboards, no roller skates, no micro, no bikes, no roller blades, and no mopes. <laughs> so you better be in a good mood if you're going to go there and have fun. <sighs> well, so we're in this series called Follow. It's all about what it means to follow Jesus, and we're looking at his life in the book of Mark. And last week, we saw the Jewish religious leaders called the Pharisees. We saw them attempt to embarrass Jesus over the issue of hand washing and ceremonial purity. And Jesus, of course, as he always does, he turns the whole thing on its head and he exposed their hypocrisy and their entire approach to knowing God as just play acting and false. Well, today, just one chapter later in Mark 8, Mark 8, we once again see the same religious leaders confront Jesus. And this time they want, guess what? A sign. There's that tie-in. <laughs> this time they want a sign from him. Now, before we get to that part of the story, let's just set the scene. So the Pharisees assiduously avoided contact with Gentiles or non-Jews. Okay, they avoided contact with non-Jews because they believed that it made them unclean and impure with God. And one of their rules, one of their rules was that they were never under any circumstances to enter the home of a Gentile or to eat with a Gentile or even for that matter to buy food from a Gentile. So 
Here's what happened immediately after Jesus had the skirmish with the Pharisees that we talked about last week over hand washing. This is just Mark 7, verse 24. It says, this is right after it happens. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre. Now, the city of Tyre is actually still there today. It's in modern day, it's in modern day Lebanon. And I have it on a map on screen for you. So in Tyre, Jesus encounters a Syrian woman who is a Gentile and heals her daughter. Then he travels a little further north to Sidon, which is deeper into Gentile territory, where he heals a Gentile man who is deaf and mute by touching the man's ears and then touching the man's tongue. After he does this, then Jesus moves to another Gentile area that's east of the Sea of Galilee called the Decapolis or the Ten Towns. And you can see on the map where they are east of the Jordan River. Okay, so that's where we pick up the story. This is Mark 8, verse 1. About this time, another large crowd had gathered. Notice that yet again, it seems like it happens every single time, we see people are drawn to Jesus by the hundreds and the thousands. This happens over and over and over. So large crowd had gathered and the people ran out of food again. Wait a minute, what's again? Well, if you remember just two chapters ago, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus was teaching a crowd of 10 to 15,000 Jews who had no food and no easy access to it. And so Jesus miraculously fed them by multiplying five bagels and two fish sticks. Well, guess what? Deja vu. Okay, so continuing in Mark 8, Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. Now this passage here gives a, gives a window into the powerful attractiveness of Jesus. People were willing to travel for days and then to camp out for three days in the desert, and they've even run out of the food just to hear him teach. They're willing to camp out in the desert, even though they've run out of food, just to be near Jesus. You know, I can't imagine what it must have been like to hear Jesus teach. I mean, think about this for a second. Think of the most powerful experience you've ever had with a speaker of any kind. Maybe you're at a convention or a conference, or maybe it was on TV or, or somewhere, but just think about one of the most powerful experiences you've ever had with a speaker of any kind, the, their, their ability to, to, to draw you in and, and to tell stories that, that resonate with your life and, and make you laugh. Someone who, who seems to have a window into your soul and is speaking right to you in your situation and you don't ever want it to end, right? When they're, when they're talking, it's like, just keep going. I want, I want to stay in this zone. You know, I, I don't think we begin to understand what Jesus was like. We, we don't understand how, how attractive and, and, and how many people just wanted to be around. And we have kind of Sunday schooled Jesus. We've domesticated him. We, we've turned him into a two-dimensional, mild-mannered, inoffensive, Jesus is my buddy kind of guy. He's really, really nice, Jesus is. You know, cue the sparkly tooth or something there. He's the kind of person you'd want to date your grandma, right? <laughs> Problem with that is, though, that that's not the kind of person you would want as a friend. And that's not the kind of person you would follow. And that is certainly not the kind of person you would give your life to or your life for. So here's the thing. Yes, Jesus was unconditionally loving. And yes, Jesus was radically compassionate, but he was also bold and courageous and brilliant and wise and funny and deep and unwilling to bend to peer pressure and popular opinion. And he was ready to take whatever action was required in the moment. Jesus was the kind of person that you would want to be around. And if you were around Jesus long enough, you would end up in one of two places. 
Either you would surrender your life to him and your will and your future to him as your Lord, or you would reject him and walk away or try to destroy him like the Pharisees. See, there's really no room for a nice Jesus in our lives. There's really no room for somebody that you can put on a shelf and just, just bring them down, admire them from time to time, but never really sacrifice for or be shaped by or, or obedient to. Jesus did not leave that option open to us. Matter of fact, we won't get to it today, but here's where Mark chapter 8 ends. Jesus says this, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way Take up your cross, that means be willing to suffer for me, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Okay, that's not Jesus, my buddy, talking right there. That is the Jesus who is the Lord of everyone and everything speaking. All right, back to our story. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll faint along the way for some of them have come a long distance. His disciples replied, well, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So... Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, thanked God for them, and broke them into pieces. He gave them to his disciples who distributed the bread to the crowd. A few small fish were found too. So Jesus also blessed these and told the disciples to distribute them. They ate as much as they wanted. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men, so that means maybe eight or 10,000 counting women and children, in the crowd that day, and Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. Immediately after this, he got into a boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. Now, this miracle here, the feeding of the 4,000, is striking for at least two reasons. First of all, it's another reminder of how thick headed Jesus disciples are okay just just a, a few chap couple chapters back they saw Jesus feed 5,000 men maybe 10,000 or 15,000 with women and children so they've already seen Jesus multiply bread once not to mention all the other miracles that they witness but it doesn't occur to them that maybe he could do that again <laughs> And if truth be told, we are so much like them. No matter how many times God shows up in our lives, no matter how many times God provides for us, we still worry about the future. And I can hear God saying, really? Really? After all I've done, you still don't get it? You still don't trust me? You still don't think I can provide for you? second reason this miracle stands out is because of where it takes place. The ten towns, or the Decapolis, as I was talking about. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is Gentile territory. Now, here's the thing. Jesus never did anything by accident. Everything that he says, everything that he does points to who he is and why he's come. So, last week, in Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees confront Jesus about not following Jewish ritual, and Jesus says, hey, it's not Jewish ritual that makes you right with God. It's what's in your heart that counts. And then what does he do? He physically moves out of Jewish territory into Gentile territory, and he starts healing Gentiles, non-Jews. He starts speaking with them. He starts touching them, all of which would make him ceremonially unclean. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus miraculously feeds 10,000 Jews. Here in Mark chapter 8, he miraculously feeds 10,000 Gentiles. What is Jesus saying? Here's what I think it is. The kingdom of God is for everyone. <laughs> My kingdom, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is for everyone. It doesn't matter how close you seem or how far 
you are. It doesn't matter if your life looks perfect or is obviously messed up. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Jesus says, I came for everyone. I came to set every person free. I came to make every person clean, to change every person's heart. I have the power to transform you no matter who you are and no matter what your story. My kingdom is for you. Period. You know, we all have people in our minds that we think don't deserve God's love. And we're pretty sure that they're going to receive His judgment. When they stand before Him, you know, they'll get what's coming to them. But the reality is that none of us deserve God's love. And outside of the death and resurrection of Jesus, every one of us will be judged and found wanting. See, Jesus' kingdom is for anyone who responds to Him. Anyone who is willing to surrender to Him regardless of their ugly past or their messy present. Jesus' kingdom is for all who desire it. That's what He's saying. First to the Jews, and then he branches out, says, hey, you non-Jews, it's for you too. All right, let's keep reading Mark chapter 8, verse 11. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him. <laughs> surprise, surprise, right? Okay, no sooner does Jesus step his foot back on Jewish soil than the Pharisees come to confront him. They've been waiting for him, and they dog on it. They are going to do their best to take you out Jesus, testing him, they demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. Question, have these Pharisees not seen enough signs? Are you kidding me? I mean, really, they've been there from the beginning. They've seen Jesus cast out evil spirits. They've seen him heal diseases. They, 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 they were there after he healed a man with leprosy. And then Jesus sent the man, the healed man, to the priests to be examined. In Capernaum, they saw Jesus make a paralyzed man able to walk. In a synagogue, he healed a man with a, with a deformed hand. Not long after that, he took the daughter of a synagogue leader who had died and brought her back to life. And the Pharisees saw most of this with their own eyes. They were there, and now they ask him for a sign? I mean, what's left? Well, the answer is nothing. There's nothing left. See, when the Pharisees are asking for a, quote, sign from heaven, they're not asking for another healing. They have in mind a particular kind of sign. Scholar Jeffrey Gibson writes about it. This is what he says. A sign from heaven, quote unquote, a sign from heaven is something that is apocalyptic in tone, triumphalistic in character, and the embodiment of one of the mighty deeds of deliverance that God had worked on Israel's behalf in rescuing it from slavery. In other words, when the Pharisees demand a sign from heaven, they're asking Jesus to prove that he's the Messiah by crushing their Roman Gentile enemies and ushering God's kingdom in right then and there. If you really are the Messiah, then prove it. Do it right now. And ironically, ironically, they make this request just after Jesus has put a pin on the idea that he came to bless Jews and Gentiles alike. <laughs> Jesus, we demand that you be the Messiah right now on our timetable. What do you do with that? How does Jesus respond? Verse 12, when he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign. I tell you the truth, I will not give this generation any such sign. That phrase, sighed deeply, it means to groan intensely. All right, Jesus is experiencing intense emotion right now. He's going, oh my goodness, I cannot believe these guys. 
And actually, in, in, in Greek, the original language here, Jesus' response isn't a question, you know, why do these people keep demanding? Actually, it's just a phrase. And here's how it reads. If a sign will be given to this generation, that's it. I mean, that's not even a complete sentence. And that's because it's part of a Jewish idiom. It's part of an oath that would normally be completed with the phrase, may I die. If this doesn't happen, may God strike me dead. In other words, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, okay, listen up. I will die before I give you the sign that you're looking for. That sign will be given the way you want it. Ain't gonna happen. Jesus has had it up to here with these obstinate, blind, unbelieving, stiff-necked religious leaders. And we see, we see it in verse 13. So he got back into the boat and left them. And he crossed the other side of the lake. And actually, this right here, this is a dividing line in, in the book of, of Mark. Up to this point, Jesus has been willing to engage the Pharisees. He's been willing to answer their questions, even when they weren't genuine questions. He's been willing to explain himself, even though he knows they're trying to trap him. He's been willing to debate with them and have a back and forth, but no more. From here on out in the book of Mark, Jesus sets his sights on Jerusalem, where he knows he will be crucified, where his death on the cross will happen, and that is the true sign and the genuine ushering in of God's kingdom in a way that no one expects. So what does this have to say to you and me? Well, here's something that I notice. The Pharisees obviously don't believe in Jesus, but honestly, neither do his disciples, right? I mean, they, they can't figure out that maybe he could multiply the bread again. So Pharisees don't believe in Jesus, his disciples, they don't really believe in him either, obviously. So, so what's the difference? Why does Jesus turn toward his disciples, but away from the Pharisees? Well, I'm sure you can guess, but here's what the difference is, I think. The difference is that while the disciples cannot see, the Pharisees will not see. Okay, the, the disciples, they can't quite see get it, and they won't get it until after Jesus' death and resurrection. And then it's like, oh, 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 now I understand. The Pharisees, on the hand, other hand, will never get it because they refuse to. They will not see. Jesus' disciples, they want to see. They, they, they long to understand. And yes, they get petty, and they grumble, and they're dull, and they're often really full of themselves and just bumbling along. But in their heart of hearts, the disciples really have given themselves to Jesus. And so Jesus is so patient with them. And he knows that after his death and resurrection, they will be transformed and they will understand. The Pharisees, on the other hand, it's not that they can't see, it's that they won't see. It doesn't matter what Jesus does. They will refuse to believe him no matter what happens. Even if all their questions were answered and all their challenges were met, they will not follow Jesus because they have already decided how God is going to work and whatever Jesus does, he's not it. And therefore, the Pharisees will not allow even God himself standing before them in the flesh to change their minds. And see, at the end of the day, it's not about how many miracles you see or how many ways Jesus reveals himself to you. It's always a matter of the will. It's always a matter of the will. Of course, there are good arguments. There are good reasons to believe that Jesus really is who he claims to be. But, but, but you can't argue anyone into the kingdom. You can't debate someone into following Jesus. They must be willing to weigh the evidence and then choose to take a step of faith. It's a matter of the will. It's a matter of of the will and the Pharisees refuse to consider that Jesus is who he claims to be. They have steeled their will against him. And I think the message for us is that if we're not careful, 
we can do the same thing. Jesus is very clear that, that it's dangerous for us to steal our will against God. One of my favorite book series is The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. And, and then I can't remember which book it is, but in The Magician's Nephew, um, in this series, Narnia is created when Aslan, who he's the lion that represents Jesus, Narnia is created when Aslan sings it into being. And the creation song, it reveals Aslan's majesty and his glory, and it's this, this grand call to worship. But, but there is one person, Uncle Andrew, in this series, who refuses to hear, An hear Aslan's song, and the consequences are staggering. Listen to what C.S. Lewis writes. When the great moment came and the beast spoke, he missed, that's Andrew, he missed the whole point for a rather interesting reason. When the lion had first begun singing long ago when it was still quite dark, he had realized that the noise was a song, and he had disliked the song very much. It made him think and feel things that he did not want to think and feel. Then when the sun rose and he saw that sing the singer was a lion, only a lion, as he said to himself, he tried his hardest to make himself believe that it wasn't singing and actually never had been singing, only roaring as any lion might in a zoo in our own world. Of course it can't really have been singing, he thought. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? <laughs> And the longer and more beautifully the lion sang, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. And listen to this. Now the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. <laughs> Uncle Andrew did. He soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song. Soon he couldn't have heard anything else, even if he had wanted to. And when at last the lion spoke and said, Narnia, awake, he didn't hear any words. He heard only a snarl. And when the beasts spoke in answer, he heard only barkings and growlings and bayings and howling. Is there any place in your life where you are refusing to hear what Jesus is saying? Is there any place in your life where you are refusing to see what Jesus is doing? Is there any place in your life where you are refusing to go where Jesus is inviting? Beware, lest you move from cannot to will not. Because cannot will eventually become can. By the power of Jesus' death and resurrection and through His grace, cannot becomes can. But will not remains will not unless and until you choose to surrender. So what's it going to be? Are you going to be a Pharisee? A will not or a disciple who at the moment can't but is ready to. Let's think about this for just a moment. Where are you refusing to hear what Jesus is saying? Stop and listen. Where are you refusing to see what Jesus is doing? Open your eyes. Where are you refusing to go where Jesus is calling you? Step into it. Move forward. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the truths that come to life as we dive into your word. And Lord, I ask that these truths will come to life in us and, and, 
and that, that you will use this word to move us toward you. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you will reveal to us the areas in which we are refusing to listen, refusing to see, refusing to go, the places where you're, you're inviting us and calling us and whispering to us. And then give us the courage to move forward and to follow you wholeheartedly. And Lord, any area where there is a will not, Jesus, in your name, I pray that you will transform that into a cannot, that you will give us eyes to see, that you'll pierce through the fog and shine light in the dark areas. And let us see you truly and surrender ourselves to you fully. Thank you. In your strong name we pray. Amen. In my mother's womb Oh, 